thank you all for being here. We should talk about cyanotoxins. First of all, I would like to thank uh, ILSI and also the uh, International Association for Food Protection for inviting me to speak here today and talk about the work that EPA has been doing regarding cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins in drinking water. So I'll go here. Okay. So today I will be talking about um, after Kelly's presentation, go more on detail of what are harmful algal blooms, um, what are the roots of exposures and adverse health effects, uh, those adverse health effects that will, may interest you more in animals and maybe plants, the overview of the, how we develop our health advisories and the work that we are doing on recreational waters, and um, um, then opportunity for questions. So why are we talking about harmful algal blooms? Why do we have a session on this conference about cyanotoxins in drinking water? And as Kelly, as, as Kelly mentioned, uh, the prevalence and frequency and also the intensity of harmful algal blooms is increasing in the U.S. and worldwide. And honestly, we don't know if it is because we're looking more for them or because they are really increasing in frequency. What we know is that they cause harmful effects in our water and also in health. How? Um, when they grow, they take space in the water and they could affect the water quality in that water system, um, causing hypoxia, which is the depletion of oxygen in that water system that could lead to fish kills. They also cause taste and other problems in drinking water systems, um, and they could be at levels that could be of concern concern and risk to human health if they are consuming drinking water. Uh, in addition to that, we have economic issues. When we have to close the beach, when we have to address uh, or issue a health advisory, and when we have to issue a do not drink um, report. Um, as Kelly also mentioned, uh, there's a presence, we have recorded presence of uh, cyanotoxins in drinking water, finished drinking water. In 2014, we have the city of Toledo uh, issuing a do not drink that affected more than 500,000 uh, people in that uh, community. Uh, last year, we have the Ohio River bloom that affected four states. And this year, Florida issued a, a state of emergency for four counties uh, due to HABs in surface water. So what are harmful algal blooms and what are cyanohabs? Algal blooms are natural components of marine and freshwater flora. It's our interest is not to kill every plant that we see in the water. They are necessary. They are part of the photosynthesis. They are part of producing the oxygen that we have. They are part, natural parts of the ecosystem. However, certain conditions that Kelly already discussed make them grow. And when they grow, they grow. They take space, as I mentioned, and um, they turn on what is known as a bloom. So that is a bloom. When we have harmful algal blooms, it's also others that produce toxins. Some can produce toxins, not all of them produce toxins. So by looking at, at a bloom in a water system, you don't know if it's toxic or not. They tend to occur in late summer and fall in temperate zones, and also uh, they could be all year round in tropical areas as well. And under the right conditions, all type of algae can cause harmful algal blooms. There's a difference between the cyanobacterial blooms and the harmful algal blooms because cyanobacteria used to, know, used to be known as blue-green algae is more frequent in freshwater systems. And also, the big difference is that they are not algae. They are bacteria with some characteristics of, plant, of plants. Um, one species can produce a toxin, one species can produce multiple toxins. And then you have a species that could be toxic, but not necessarily will produce toxin at that time. So again, by looking at a bloom, you don't know that it's toxic or not. Um, the important, another important thing about these cyanobacterial toxins is that the toxins, since it's a bacteria, are within the wall. So you can have the cell that is intact and you don't have toxins in the water. Once that cell breaks, it releases the toxin. So again, you may have a cyanobacterial species that is toxic producing, but you don't have toxins in the water because they are within the cell. Microcystins, it was mentioned. Microcystin is, that we know, is the most common toxin uh, worldwide. And again, we don't know if it is the most common or, or it's because we are looking more for microcystin uh, that we know of. We have around 100 congeners of microcystins. So these are different types of congeners. Um, 
Microcystin is a hepatotoxic, so affects the liver. And the most studied and widespread is a microcystin LR. So you, let me see if I can use this. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, so on this side, oh, I lost it. So on this side, on the right side, is a table that describes common freshwater cyanotoxins, the type of toxin that it is, and the species that produce them. So as you can see, different species can produce different toxins, and they, you can have a mixture of toxins in one time um, in a freshwater system. Um, this is part of what Kelly mentioned. This is a 2007 EPA national lex assessment. Uh, we do uh, the EPA uh, in collaboration with USGS, but EPA is the lead on that project. We do uh, um, uh, national assessments of water quality uh, nationwide. We produce that every five years. We just released, or we're, no, we're about to release a 2012 national lakes assessment. We have um, other assessments like ocean assessment and wetlands and rivers, etc. This one is a national lakes assessment. In 2007, we sampled for microcystin, and 32% of the overall detections were positive for um, microcystin. And we have to be very uh, specific and clear that the national National Lakes Assessment is not a bloom chaser. It is, uh, it is a, a program that takes samples in lakes, random, in different places, uh, just to determine the quality of that system. We are not sampling where the bloom is. So by having 32% of positive uh, for uh, microsystem detections was something very important for us. Okay, moving to the adverse effects. There are different potential routes of exposure when you um, are regarding cyanotoxins. I'm, not, I'm focusing now on cyanotoxins as well. So you can have cyanotoxins in drinking water and food. You can ingest uh, during recreational activities. Uh, while you are recreating, you can also have dermal contact with the toxins and also inhalation of aerolyzed toxins. The toxins do not evaporate, so we're not talking about they're going to be in the air. They can be in aerolytes or water drops. Um, there are different health effects related depending on the body of the, si of the system that is affected. As I mentioned, uh, microcystin and cylindrospermopsin, which is another toxin, they are hepatotoxins, so they affect the liver. We have also neurotoxic effects, uh, those caused by anatoxin, anatoxin A and their groups, and also by saxitoxin. And we have dermatotoxin caused by lipopolysaccharides and limbia toxin. The symptoms could range from acute exposure, which are very related to GI effects, allergic reactions type effects, rash, ear infections, um, to more uh, serious effect when you have chronic exposure, such as uh, liver effect. Um, and the toxicity data is very limited to most of the toxins. We have, we can say, an almost complete profile for uh, microcystin LR, but not for the rest of the 100 congeners that we have on microcystin. And we don't have enough toxicity data for all the other toxins that I mentioned in the uh, previous table. So talking about the effects of cyanotoxins in animals and plants, uh, pets, um, usually dogs and livestock can be impacted by cyanotoxins, especially dogs, because they really love the scums of uh, blooms. They love to eat them. They love to play in the waters with the scum. They lick their paws. And if they are toxic uh, blooms, with the toxins released, especially anatoxin, the dog will probably die by an hour, an hour and a half. And we have seen a lot of pets dying because they have been playing, drinking, and eating the scums of toxic uh, harmful algal blooms. Um, the livestock as well, when they consume the water that is contaminated with toxic bloom that have released the toxins, they can also be impacted. Now, there have been some studies uh, in, to determine if that toxin once, once in the livestock could get into the meat or could get into the milk. The results have been, first, the studies have been very limited, and second, the results have been mixed. Some have found no toxin on the milk of that specific surviving uh, cow, uh, and also others have found very, very small amounts of the toxins in the milk. Um, and in the meat, they have been also found, but very, very uh, uh, small amounts compared to what really can cause health effects based on uh, toxicity data. Uh, cyanobacterial cells 
can be also, and cyanotoxins can be also in water that is used for irrigation. Uh, and they could be uh, found in the leaves and also in the roots. Uh, they tend to accumulate more in the roots than in the leaves. They tend to cause uh, an, a visual effect and also in inhibit the growth of the plants. So the seeds will not go and uh, the the crops will not continue. So we have seen that the, the effect or the risk from consumption of food uh, contaminated with toxins is lower compared to ingestion of drinking water or from exposure in recreational waters when you compare it with consumption of food or crops contaminated with toxins and cyanotoxins. However, the studies, um, they have been conflicting again in um, results and uh, further investigation is needed to determine what is that specific risk. Then we have fish. So cyanotoxins can be found in fish and they can be found in shellfish. Um, however, the study we we, the evaluation we conducted on the studies developed, as uh, Kelly mentioned, some of them have serious analytical issues, but also the values are all over the place in the traffic level. So you have the, the higher traffic and the lower traffic, they have higher amounts on both and different studies. So we couldn't make a determination on what is the risk of consumption of fish. What we do know is that the concentrations are higher in the gut. Uh, microcystin is very hydrophilic, so it's very soluble. It tends to get in the blood, so it doesn't attach to the muscle. So you usually find it in the liver. Uh, concentrations are higher depending on the trophic level. As I mentioned, the phytoplankton virus, virus, phytoplankton virus um, has a higher concentrations than the carnivorous fish. Um, more research, again, is needed in order to determine what is that specific risk from consumption of fish. What we do know is that more the biomagnification, a lot of biodilution is happening once the toxin gets into the water. So the risk, again, for fish consumption is less when you compare it from the risk of ingestion of drinking water and exposure of recreational water. However, we also recommend for people to do not eat the liver of the fish, which is something that we usually removed when we eat our fish, but based on the um, a culture and also geographical area, some people tend to eat the entire fish, and that's when the risk increase uh, because of the amount of toxin that could be in the liver. Let's talk now about the current public guidelines for cyanotoxins in drinking water and recreational waters. Again, my, the focus of this presentation is drinking water and recreational water. So as Kelly mentioned, we don't have a federal regulation um, for cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins. And I'm going to take just one minute here to tell you a little bit about how we develop regulations in EPA. So the regulations for drinking water are based on the Safe Drinking Water Act. That's the act that asks or um, ask EPA to determine what are those maximum contaminant levels of contaminants that could be in drinking water systems. So in order to do that, we have a program that is called the Contaminant Candidate List, the CCL. That CCL is published every five years. And in that list, we include those contaminants that could be present in drinking water and could have an adverse um, risk to human health if they are consumed and for which we don't have any regulation. So CCL published um, every five years, I mentioned, included cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins in 1998. That was our first CCL. And so when we look at the list of cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins and we find out that, that we have around 1,000 uh, cyanotoxins, including all the congeners, we said that's impossible. So let's let's reduce that line. And so in CCL2, uh, we passed that uh, and we evaluated what are the most common toxins that are here in the United States based on the surveys of that um, particular year in 2002. And we determined that microcystin LR and three other congeners, anatoxin A, cylindrospermopsin, those three toxins are the most common in freshwater systems in the US. Okay, let's focus our attention then to those. So CCL3, we included these three toxins and the other three congeners uh, for uh, evaluation. So what we do in, in the CCL is we evaluate what is the occurrence of those toxins in our drinking water systems uh, and what are the health effects of those toxins um, once you are exposed by ingesting drinking water. And that's exactly what we did with the health effects support document that I will discuss in a minute and also developing the health advisories in interim as waiting for regulation if we are going to regulate. Um, so right now we have the cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins also listed in CCL4. 
Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule is a program that supports CCL. So, as I mentioned, you need to know the health effects and occurrence in drinking water. How do you know occurrence by in drinking water? By the unreg Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, also known as UCMR. With UCMR, we ask public water systems to monitor during a specific time for that specific chemical, provides the data to EPA, and that way we determine how often are these contaminants in our drinking water systems. That, with the health data, we determine and we do what is known as a regulatory determination. So we determine if it, yes, based on health and occurrence, it's important that we regulate this contaminant. We say no, based on occurrence and health, we say, well, they're never found, so why do we have to regulate? Or we can make a no determination. And for cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins, that's exactly what we have done. We have not made a determination because we don't know what is the occurrence of cyanotoxins in drinking water systems. At this moment, cyanotoxins were included in UCMR. The reason for that is because we didn't have a standardized method uh, for us to determine and for the water systems to use and um, detect the, these toxins in drinking water systems. So, the monitoring will start in 2018. By 2021, we should know how often our toxins are present in drinking water systems, and then we will make a determination if we're going to regulate or not. These are the guidelines um, that are in place at this moment. As Kelly mentioned, the World Health Organization is the one that is used more often. It's a provisional value uh, to microsystem LR because, as I mentioned, 100 congeners and they decided we don't have enough information for the other. So let's say that it's provisional to just one congener microsystem. Um, Health Canada has 1.5, Australia 1.3, and, and many others. As you see at the bottom, Ohio and Oregon, they have the ones that we develop. Uh, they adopted the, our health advisories 0 0.3 and 1.6, 0 and 0 0.7 and 3, and Minnesota has the lowest uh, value of 0 0.1. And all these values, as you can see, they vary uh, on the way that you uh, develop your risk assessment and the different parameters that you use in your risk assessment, including your body weight, daily intake of water, and uh, uncertainty factors that are included in that calculation. And also the study that you select. Moving to recreational waters, we don't have any of the federal regulations for cyanobacteria, cyanotoxins in recreational water. Um, the World Health Organization had developed, as you can see on this slide, um, different values based on different parameters. Um, they, they, it is a tier process uh, based on acute health effects uh, for cyanobacteria cells and then an estimation on the um, microcystin LR. These are not values uh, found on any study. These are just estimations from WHO that if you have 100,000 cells, you may have, you have possibly have 10 to 20 microsystem, uh, micrograms per liter of microsystem LR. I have to say that both the drinking water and the recreational water are under review by the WHO and the experts teams that we're working with them. And hopefully in one to two years, we will have new values for drinking water, recreational waters from the World Health Organization. These guidance values have been adapted by many of the uh, countries, as I mentioned, and also by states. And I know this is a very busy uh, table. I don't want you to read all of that. But if you could, and you see the numbers, I might, the, the point of using this table is for you to see the, the variety of values and the way that the states have been using these values um, so differently. For example, California uses toxins. It's microsystem 0.8. Um, but Iowa uses toxins as well, but the microsystem 20 micrograms per liter, a big disparity. Um, also, you have Massachusetts, it's 14 micrograms per liter. Um, Texas, they don't use uh, toxins, only 20 when they have more than 100,000 cells. So some states use cells, other use bio volume, the other ones use toxins. There's a big a difference on how they apply these toxins and cyanobacteria cells. So now we can go. Now that we have a good overview of uh, HAVs and CyanoHAVs, maybe we can go and talk a little bit about how we develop the health advisories. Let's start by saying what are health advisories. Health advisories is an informal technical guidance 
for those unregulated drinking water contaminants to help the states, federal, and, local, and other local agencies manage the public water systems for contaminants for which we don't have regulation and for which we could have an emergency. The, the program of the Drinking Water Health Advisories were developed, was developed in 1980s uh, after a big spill of, I don't remember the chemical, and, and I can't pronounce it, but um, in order to address those spills and emergency uh, problems. Uh, they are non-regulatory concentrations. They could either be used as they are, or they could be adapted by the states, or they could not be used. They are non-regulatory, they are advised, um, and are for those chemicals that will not cause um, a non-carcinogenic effect. So we develop, since these are emergencies, we develop health advisories from exposure to one day, 10-day exposures, a lifetime, and also we do carcinogenic as well. And I have to say that there are short-term exposures. We develop both for children and also for adults. And the chronic exposures, of course, is only for adults. Uh, as of now, 2016, we have around 200 chemicals um, and toxins um, that we have developed uh, health advisories. Uh, we have one day, 10 day, and we have lifetime advisories. I just included here to give you an overview of, of how many advisories we have developed here at EPA. And we only have one uh, for the blue baby syndrome uh, that is not within that range of exposure that we usually do. Very important is that the health advisory, since they are not regulatory, they are subject to change as new information is available. So that's what we're doing with the cyanotoxins. We're waiting for new toxicity data in order to evaluate, even though they were published uh, last year. So in 2012, uh, way before Toledo, we joined efforts with Health Canada. Health Canada, uh, they have a regulation for microcystin. Um, they, they, it was 2002 regulation. They wanted to update it, and we said, let's join efforts and do it together. And we develop our health advisories, and you develop your, um, and update your regulation. So 2013, uh, we did a literature review. We have toxicity profiles that the Office of Research and Development have developed for these three toxins. We used that, we updated it, and uh, we determined a value. Um, and we developed what is known as a health effect support document. The health effect support document is the document that EPA uses in order to determine what are the health effects when we compare with the occurrence, remember, under the CCL and determine if we need to regulate. So for each contaminant, we have to develop this document first, which is a comprehensive review. It's, when I say comprehensive, it's very comprehensive. We're talking about hundreds of pages uh, and description to detail of the rats and on the mouse and on the blood and on all, all that happened during those studies. So it's, it's, it's very depressing, it's a depressing document. But uh, it's very comprehensive and tells, you, you, can, you can determine what are the health effects from that document, or at least determine what is the um, main study that you select and what are the health effects that are most prominent at the lower dose, um, and with that you can determine the reference dose. Uh, so in 2014, 2015, we did develop the health advisory uh, for two toxins. When we did the health effect support document, we did an external peer review. The peer reviewers uh, indicated that we don't have data, uh, enough data to develop a health advisory for anatoxins. So we only went with two. We have microcystins and cylindrospermopsin. Um, Yeah, that's what we did. So we developed the health advisory in 2015. They were published in June, 2000, um, June 17, 2015. The health advisory is a short document. It has only what are the health effects, how do we get into that decision. It includes a section on, on analytical methods that are available, and includes a section on the treatment techniques that are available in drinking water. Again, this is for drinking water. Um, at that time, the EPA's, EPA's Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water also developed a recommendation document uh, called the Recommendations for Public Water Systems to Manage Cyanotoxins in Drinking Water. And it's for those water systems that are interested in dealing with the, with the issue of cyanotoxins to use as a guide and develop their own plan on how to develop or uh, adapt to health advisories and what treatments and analytical methods are, uh, can be used. And as you see at the bottom right, uh, they have a red, yellow, uh, green light um, uh, way, and it's also a tier process on different ways on how you can deal with the toxins if you find them in your finished water, and in your raw water as well. 
So um, we published drinking water health advisories for microcystin and cindrospermopsin. Microcystin, as I mentioned, was the one that we had all the toxicity data. We had a little bit for another congeneer. But we used microcystin LR as a surrogate for all microcystins. So that's why the health advisories for microcystins. And why we did that? First, we have the toxicity data. And second, based on LD50 studies, lethal dose studies that determine the potency of that um, a specific congeneer, LR is as toxic or more than the other congeneer. So therefore, by covering with uh, microcystin LR, we're covering uh, with the other uh, toxic congeners as well. We develop short-term 10 days health advisories, which we believe is going to be uh, the exposure you will have uh, once uh, the treatment water um, is, is detecting that uh, value. It will have 10 days for them to uh, deal with the issue. And we did not develop uh, lifetime values or carcinogenic values, um, even though it was uh, microcystin is a 2B group uh, um, based on IRC, uh, IRC, IRC yes. Um, we determined that the studies, uh, we don't have a bioassay of two years that will support, and based on EPA guidelines for carcinogenicity, uh, we don't have enough data or adequate data to determine the carcinogenicity at this moment. So as I mentioned, we have developed uh, two values, one for bottle fed, it's, since it's a short term, we develop for children and adults, and so it's uh, one year um, children, and then it's the adult. Now, when we plotted um, the values uh, based on, on the age, uh, we determined um, that the one year was not covered by the 0 0.3, so we moved our health advisory to cover that school age children. So the value, the, school, the children's value is all the way to school age, around six years, and then the adults start with six to adulthood. Why? Because based on the EPA exposures factors, um, the children in both bottle fed infants consume large amounts of water based on their body weights. And you can see on the top chart uh, to your top left, um, birth all the way to one year, they consume more water, sometimes five times more water than adults. And that's usually because during that first year, uh, water, either bottle fed or um, um, breastfeeding, is usually the, the only uh, food that they consume. It's after the six months or maybe a year that they start adding other food into their diet. They start with the cereal, they start with the uh, juice and other. And then the exposure, I mean the consumption, the ingestion rates um, to drinking water start going down until they come very close to adults. So that's why we wanted to be protective uh, to the children and we moved that uh, value not to one year but all the way to six. While we did that um, health effect support document, we also found many toxicity uh, research needs. Um, we found one study uh, for microcystin LR that uh, show um, effects on the male reproductive system. However, that was one study. Uh, it has many gaps. Uh, we couldn't get into get the information from the authors, even though we send many emails. Um, and so we are replicating that study now um, in, uh, within, with NIH to determine if there is uh, that um, male reproductive uh, effects from exposure to microcystin LR. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the value is more conservative than it could be, because once we got that information, then we will edit the value as well. Uh, there's also toxicity studies that have found um, effects in pregnancy and the offspring as well. Um, and that is part of our evaluation um, at this moment. Uh, the potency of other microsystem congeners is a big gap, and, uh, and ORD is planning to start in two years uh, a study to determine what are, what are the effects on other congeners. Um, the effects of inhalation, dermal exposures to microsystems, cylindrospermopsin, and anatoxin, we have very, very just limited studies on what is that effect. Uh, acute and chronic toxicity of anatoxin, we have nothing on that, or the chronic toxicity of cylindrospermopsin. What are the carcinogenic potential? What are the health risks from mixtures? As I mentioned, you can have a species producing the three toxins. What is that health effects? We don't know that. And also, if there is bioaccumulation of cytotoxins in fish. Okay, so the last slide is on recreational ambient water quality criteria. As you heard, we are developing an ambient water quality criteria. Uh, based, this is on another um, statute, which is the Clean Water Act, that recommends the recreational ambient water quality criteria to protect uh, from recreational exposure. Uh, 
Uh, we are developing for two toxins, microcystin and cylindrospermopsin, and um, um, we will be focusing on um, recreational exposure and immersion and incidental ingestion of uh, surface water. Uh, we will. We have looked at the data that we have on dermal inhalation, and it's not enough. Uh, therefore, our um, uh, advisory, I mean, our recreational criteria will be based on ingestion, again. And um, consumption of fish and shellfish will not be included in these uh, recreational criteria. For that, we have what is known as a human health ambient water quality criteria uh, that we are planning to um, develop once we have the information from fish studies that ORD is also conducting. Uh, we have a good draft that is uh, under review by our advisory team, and we hope to have a draft for public comments uh, this fall 2016. There's a disclaimer, and this is my contact information. I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I'm from the FDA, and so I've done a bit of research on the fish, shellfish, and yeah. as well as the BGA supplements. And so it was really interesting to see just the water perspective. But being an analytical chemist, I was trying to figure out what was the method that you were going to use for the 2018 to 21 surveys for the for the materials, um, just because so many of the methods are, are so lacking for those toxins. That's correct. Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you for your question. The question is about what methods we will be using for our UCMR for the detection of toxins in our drinking water system, um, along with, I should have included in this slide, along with the health advisories, we also published two methods. It's 522, 523. Uh, these are LCMSMS methods for one for, um, Microcystin and nodularin, which is another toxin, and another one for amatoxin A and um, uh, cylindrospermopsin. Um, in addition to that, they will be using ELISA, EDDA, ADDA, uh, as well to test and um, determine what is the validity of using ELISA and LCMSMS. And I saw your face doing like this, like, oh my God, don't use ELISA. And the problem with ELISA is that um, it's not as precise as an LCMS, uh, and it could also, um, and we will hear about the method, so I will not go into, in, in, get into those waters, but um, ELISA is a method that is used a lot by the states, and um, it is a um, more accessible method, and we wanted to also try to make comparisons uh, based on what they can use uh, with the method that EPA developed. We found great success using PP2A assays and training our field investigators in those, mm -hmm. and uh, that assay kit should become more available in about the next year, because you know currently there's the Spanish producer of it, and it's been a little difficult to get a hold of. The PP2A assay is so much easier than the ELISA, and it does a much better job at ignoring nodularin, which uh, is not really a huge concern, but is right. quite commonly co-occurring. It's, it's very similar. So I don't know if that would help at all, but if you... If well, you guys are interested, um, it's a great essay, and that publication should be out soon. So, well, it will help uh, using that other particular method um, that you send that to either to me, and I will share it with the team talk, um, working on CMR because I don't have any say on what method they select. But it will it, it will really help us to get that information. Thank you. Uh, very good talk. Um, kind of a, a little more general question about irrigation water quality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who regulates? water used for irrigation? Well, um, that's a very good question. Who regulates the water used for, regu uh, for irrigation? I, I will assume it's USDA, but I don't, I don't know. I don't think we do, although we got a lot of questions. And just recently, Utah had an issue with their lakes and water, and they just gave me a call they're being used in irrigation uh, with high accounts of cyanobacteria cells. It's recommended not to use once you have cyanobacteria cells, because the cells breaks and you can have the toxin. Uh, but maybe someone had that information. Um, I, I honestly don't, don't know. I assume it's USDA. Maybe it's EPA. I don't know. Well, this must just that the agricultural water should be irrigated for the water. Right. 
It is, it is, that's a very good comment. Um, we have many bridges that we need to make either <laughs> longer and stronger. Um, the same thing with uh, what is marine and fresh water as well with NOAA and, and EPA, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of cross. Um, when it comes to drinking water, then it comes to our, us, uh, potable water, and that's why I guess I'm getting all the questions on irrigation as well. Um, and I, I don't know how involved USDA is, uh, although they are part of the Habarca Inter Interagency Working Group for Habarca, and we work together. Um, but um, if it is potable water, then it's, it is EPA. Yeah, I, I would, <clears throat> in my interpretation of the rules and laws, it would be FDA would enforce it, EPA would set the standards, just like with pesticides. Mm -hmm. Um, EPA sets the uh, levels for pesticides. FDA enforces those. So, uh, I would, I would, I FDA would um, would enforce the uh, drinking water um, on produce, etc. These types of things because it's uh, obviously called out with FISMA. But uh, in FIFRA, yeah. uh, I see pesticide issues coming. From Delegation agreements with state department. Okay. Within FIFRA, I see that your agencies involve a state departments of agriculture for enforcement of uh, Chapter Three requirements and so on and so forth. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm just thinking of various examples of um, cases in the past where people have made antimicrobial claims that um, were challenged and it was the State Departments of Agriculture acting as delegates for EPA that came out to do enforcement actions and seize materials and so on and so forth. So, well, so, so that's what I'm saying is that, you know, USDA regulated products, they will enforce what EPA set as standards. EPA does not enforce. It sets the standards, sets the levels, okay. then FDA and USDA will enforce those and that's who you're going to be dealing with mm -hmm. if you should be out of tolerance. Okay, and so then the big concern becomes for industry that we saw that the states have very different experiences with um, various cytotoxins, mm -hmm. and they have different levels that they've established for themselves, and yet many of my clients have operations that are global, certainly in multiple states. And so uh, here's EPA, uh, they look at the, the map, and uh, some states there's very poor reporting or there's no reporting associated with it. Other states like Minnesota and South Dakota, maybe Wisconsin, there's a high prevalence. So what do you use as your basis for establishing acceptable levels of protection associated with that? As it relates to cyanotoxins? Yes. Well, we would follow the, 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 the federal EPA standards and guidelines unless the state has set their own guidelines and then understand, you know, where our products are going. Is it going to be sold in Minnesota? Is it going to be sold to all 50 states? I mean, we, we it's similar to what you deal with with regards to pesticides coming in from produce that you're importing. You know, you may have, it's perfectly tolerable to have carbendazim um, maybe in Brazil on oranges, I'm just saying, but carbendazim is not allowed. There's a zero tolerance of carbendazim. Cyanotoxins, I'm a little, little less clear because I think, that as we're noticing, <clears throat> the regulations aren't as robust and the levels aren't as robust as we see with pesticides and these types of things. But we don't have regulations. Well, right. Right now. So yeah, the but states the states can might. But the, and, right. and, that, and that's the, the problem is you can't call it a standard if it's not standard. It is not a standard, so they should not call it a standard. Only but it's just do. like interpretation of, you know, the, the state laws, you know, for Minnesota, um, you know, are going to be a little bit nuanced compared to federal and the FDA. And, um, you know, this is the complexity of the regulatory environment in which we live. And sometimes, I mean, as Cargill, we have... FDA and USDA regulated facilities. Although, you know, so for instance, if we are bringing in raw egg, liquid egg, USDA regulates that. In the next room, it's being cooked. So now FDA has jurisdiction. Now we add ham to it. In the next room, USDA has it again. So we can be, we can have three different rooms of under the, in the same structure. That's USDA, FDA, USDA. It gets dicey quickly. Good word for it. Yeah. 
Thank you. Right? Thank you. All right.